So in the 1970s, there was what was often referred to as the Jesus movement. Maybe you remember this. What had happened is in the late 1960s, the hippies had moved to San Francisco, the Haight-Ashbury district. But after years of the sexual revolution really going on and the drug culture that was created, they began to develop this real sense of hopelessness. And some phenomenal churches came out of that movement, such as Calvary Chapel and Chuck Smith there in California. And there began this revolution of people just in masses turning to Jesus. However, they didn't look or sound in their music or in their dress like the traditional church or what many think of as traditional Christians. They were different. And so they became the Jesus freaks, the Jesus culture, the Jesus movement. And one of the iconic scenes out of that movement is Chuck Smith, the pastor there at Calvary Chapel, baptizing on the beach. And I watched a video recently and there he has the church gathered there and he's preaching to him. He's calling people to repent and be baptized. And he's standing there in the water and he's saying, this water is actually a symbol of a grave, that all of your past is buried inside this water and out of this comes new life. And Exodus chapter 15 is beach music. It's a song from the beach. After the people of Israel have been delivered out of the Red Sea, the Egyptian army has been destroyed and all their charioteers as a result of this. Now they're standing back and literally looking on the beach as the soldiers are being washed up there. And their natural instinct, their reflex is to sing. This is a turning point in the book. Now, Egypt is in the rearview mirror. The promised land is in their sights. And their natural reflex after God delivers them is to sing. Now, the number one command, the most often given command in all of Scripture is fear not. The second most often command given in Scripture is to sing. And while you can make too much of the number of the ways that things are mentioned inside the Scripture, the reality is, is that when God delivers us from fear, our natural reflex as Christians, as believers, is to sing and when we sing if you look at the songs that we sing today even as believers in the church they typically focus on two things they focus on what god has delivered us from our past and what god is delivering us to our future and so really although this song is somewhat difficult in exodus chapter 15 to uh, outline if you will provide a structure for us you can generally divide it this way it reflects what god has done in their recent past and what God is going to do in their future. And so let's look together at Exodus chapter 15. We'll start in verse one on this song on the beach as they're celebrating in one single moment what God has done for them and what God will do for them. So look at Exodus chapter 15 and let's look together at verse one. This is Exodus chapter 15, verse one. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Now we're in the part that's talking about his past. And we're going to talk about this for a few minutes. The part that talks about his past is verse 1 all the way down to verse 12. And so let's walk through these verses together. Notice, first of all, that the horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. We made this observation last week. That doesn't seem accurate. Uh, the sea folded onto them. God didn't throw them into. But this is a direct poetic allusion to the fact that in the same way that Pharaoh tried to take God's firstborn, his people, and throw them into the Nile. Now God has thrown the Egyptian army into the Red Sea. Verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. So this is Psalm 3, Jonah 3. We just read Revelation chapter 7. Salvation is from the Lord. He's become their salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. Now let me just stop here and say, this is really a remarkable thought. While they have been understanding who Abraham was for 400 years, remember there's been no prophets, there's been no temple, there's been no synagogue, no place to come and think about the God. In a real sense, they're being introduced to God, this generation is for the first time. And yet when they see God save this in this miraculous way, they immediately reflect with personal pronouns. This is my God who has saved me. This is my Father's God and I will exalt him. And immediately when they see God's salvation, they're connected back to their father, Abraham, of the faith, and they're connected to him. Now look at verse three. 
The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, this is really interesting. Again, he's talking about God's deliverance from in the past, how God has delivered them in the past sense. He says, the Lord is a man of war. Now, this is the first time God is introduced with a military kind of sense, although that's going to be a theme out throughout Scripture. But this is really the point of the text. This is not a general psalm of salvation. There's no mention of plagues and Passover. This song specifically addresses the salvation that the Lord has just accomplished for them by taking over the army of the Egyptians. The Egyptian army is not eternal. God is eternal. And he's proved this by overcoming them. That's very interesting. You think of the Lord as a man of war. You would think then that God must have an enemy. And when you think of an enemy, you think an enemy is someone who threatens us. We send our sons to war because someone has threatened, and sometimes we'll say it this way, they've threatened the national sovereignty of our country. In other words, our freedom to be and act as a sovereign nation. But if God is a man of war, that begs the question, who is his enemy? Who is a threat to God? Well, of course, Satan is the enemy of God, but Satan is no genuine threat. Satan can't take God out. He can't tempt God to do wrong. God rises above all of that. Uh, Satan is no genuine threat to God. So how in that sense could Satan be considered the enemy of God? The answer is, of course, remember from Exodus chapter 14, that while Satan is no threat to God, he is a threat to us. Remember 14, 14, the Lord fights for us. God does not need to defend himself. He is fighting on our behalf. So to say, verse 3 more explicitly, the Lord is a man of war on behalf of those with whom he will defend. Verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. We'll come back to verse 5 in a minute. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send them out in a fury. It consumes them like stubble. Stubble is the same Hebrew word to describe the hay and the straw that Pharaoh would not give to the Hebrews to build the bricks. And so the one who refused to give them stubble is now consumed like stubble. Verse 8. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. Look at these metaphors. The floods stood up in a heat. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. And so our minds want to think about what exactly would that be like to see the sea parted. And here we have some word pictures that help. Like something that's congealed or built up or heaped up. The water stood there on their sides to allow the children of Israel to pass through. Verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Now stop here, look at that. They sank like lead. Verse 5 says they went down to the depths like a stone. And if you skip to verse 16, it says it again. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. So here you see the Egyptian army immobilized by the water, sinking down like a rock. Note the irony. For 400 years, the Israelites could not leave Egypt. They were stuck. They were immobile. But now all they can do is watch the Israelites pass by, pass through, pass on to the other side while they are immobile now and sink like a rock. God has delivered them. So they sing this song about their past. But before we move on about the song of the past, go back to verse 5. And I want to draw your attention to something that I think in this song of Moses, this song written by Moses, he wants us to see. Verse 5. The floods covered them. They went down into the, watch the next word, the depths like a stone. And what's interesting about that is that word depths is the same Hebrew word, the deep, to describe Genesis chapter 1, how God separated the waters from the land. So there's an allusion here to creation that seems very, very intentional. 
In creation, God separated the water from the land. And now, in delivering his people, he separates the waters from the land. So there's a hint about creation. But there's also a hint about resurrection. Now just think about this. Both Israel and the Egyptians went down into the water. They were both threatened by the water. But Israel came out on the other side. However, the Egyptians were drowned in the water. And here we have a picture of the gospel. Everyone who is born, everyone has a physical body, will die. We don't have victory over physical death. That's not promised to a believer. We die. The difference is, is that when someone believes in Christ, they are raised to new life. They are raised to go spend eternity with their Father in heaven, while those who aren't simply go from death to a greater death. And we have that picture here of a resurrection. Israel went inside the water, but they were raised to life. And so because of that, we now have a picture of baptism as well. When someone is baptized, they are buried with water. We even say that, reflecting the text in 1 Corinthians. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. And so just to make two observations about this song of the past. First of all, God is sovereign over water. He wants us to see that. God is sovereign over water. We see that in creation. We see that in the flood. We see that here in the Exodus. We see that as Jesus walked on the water. God is sovereign over the water. He controls all of the water. But secondly, not only that, God creates new life from the water. All of creation came from the separating of the water from the land. Now we have this whole nation that is created out of the water. And then we who come to Christ have new life and we celebrate that new life by coming through the water as a symbol of coming into new life in Christ and as coming through the water is the way that we come into the church. So God gives new life through water. This song makes me think of one of my favorite songs. Listen to this. There is a fountain filled with blood. You know it, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Think about that graphic metaphor. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The imagery is all over Scripture. God saves us through water. God saves us through the blood of His Son. And when we're plunged into that flood, we come out white and clean. That's their song of deliverance. So that's the song of the past. However, it shifts in verse 13 to a song of the future. So look at verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love. That's God's hesed love, his faithful love. The people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your abode. And we can't let the word redeemed there be lost on us. Remember that all the firstborn from that point on, part of the celebration of the Passover, is all the firstborn are now consecrated to God and God would allow you to keep your firstborn, but you had to redeem them back from God with the sacrifice of an animal. And it was to picture the fact that although they were lost, God redeemed them with blood. So remember that God was not just taking them out of the nation. He was drawing them to himself and he was doing that through redemption. And so here we have in this song of Moses a very clear allusion to the fact that there is a Passover lamb that redeemed them. And so while the song is great and glorious, it's richer still for those of us who are believers. Because every time we sing, we sing in the shadow of the cross. There are things that we repeat every Sunday. We always sing about the death of Christ. We always sing about the resurrection. Why do we repeat those songs? Because those songs by their repetition remind us that the only way we belong to God is through the redemption we have from his Passover lamb. So you've led your people in steadfast love. Those you have redeemed, you have guided them by your strength into your holy abode. Now look at verse 14. Here's an interesting effect. They're talking about the future, what is going to happen. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. And here's this irony now about the immobilized Egyptians and the moving mobilized Israelites. 
And so he says, they're all in terror. Now look at verse 17. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. Now what is the mountain he's referring to? Well, we don't really know. He could be thinking about Mount Sinai. After all, Moses had already had an encounter with God there. They could be even thinking ahead to the promised land that God was going to bring them into in Jerusalem, which in itself on a mountain. But let's keep reading. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which you hands have established. So if you're reading this carefully and you're thinking with me, and I know you are, then you're thinking this thought, well, they're very specific about the other nations that would be threatened by them. We were reminded of Joshua chapter 2 where the spies begin to spy out the land where they're finally going to go in. And remember they meet Rahab the harlot and they have this conversation with her and she already gives them some intel that the people in that land are scared to death of them. So sure enough, the people are scared because they've heard of the plagues maybe or they're thinking about what God is going to do in this moment. And so the question comes up, well, how did they know in such specific detail all these things are going to happen if this was a song on the beach, a song that was reflexive just in the moment? Well, the answer is, is that maybe they were speaking prophetically. They were believing ahead for all the things that God was going to do. It'd be very possible that these nations would have already heard based on the plagues that God was moving among the people. Or it could be that while this song was sung immediately on the beach, they did what we often do. As years go on, we'll take a song and we'll modify it a little bit. We'll update it a little bit. And maybe when they got in the land of Canaan, they were still singing the song. We know after all that Miriam, in verses 19 through 21, she repeats the song. The illusion is that this one of the songs that was so popular, they would want to sing it over and over again. And so maybe that this song was repeated so often it was modified and updated. And maybe that's the case. But I think there's a more pressing issue inside the text. And let's go back to verse 15 excuse me, verse 13. You have led them in their steadfast love, the people you've redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. You see that word abode? That's not a word we would normally use, but it's also mentioned there in verse 17. You have made for your abode. Now the significance of this, especially in verse 13, is that the word abode there was a word all throughout Hebrew scriptures that was used to describe the place a shepherd would be a place a shepherd would dwell. Now that's also interesting because verse 13 says, you led in your steadfast love, the people you redeemed, you've guided them. And so maybe, just maybe Moses, who certainly had a history of being a shepherd, was connecting all of this for them. That God, as the shepherd, took them to their abode. He led them and he guided them. Now just think about the power of that. That would mean that Egypt was no accident or incident. That would mean that even the Red Sea that was daunting and awful and scary was no accident or incident because it was only going through that sea that they could experience deliverance. There's no cross without first, there's no resurrection first without a cross. There's no deliverance if there's first not something that you're threatened by. And so maybe the good shepherd led them in there so he could rescue them and bring them out of that place. But the point here is that the abode is where God is. In other words, the sheep want to simply be where the shepherd is. So maybe it's possible that the holy abode mentioned in verse 13 was the beach. It wasn't the place they were going to put down roots. That wasn't the promised land. They were moving on from there. But the point would be that what they really wanted, more than a physical place, more than deliverance, and more than even the promised land, what they wanted was the presence of God. And so it was a way of them saying, God, we want to sing in a way that expresses that we are at home when we are at home with you. So there's a, a past song and there's also a future song. But one of the thought in verse 18, there's not only a song of the past and a song of the future, but there's also a song of eternity. Look at verse 18. This is interesting. The Lord will reign forever and ever. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Hey, take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 15, if you would. Revelation chapter 15. Still thinking of verse 18. The Lord will reign forever and ever. But turn to Revelation chapter 15. If you are a church person, you've been in church for a while, 
then that phrase, the Lord will reign forever and ever, maybe re might resonate with you because you're thinking of Handel's Messiah. That's taken from Revelation chapter 11. However, Revelation chapter 11 isn't the first time that phrase is mentioned. It comes right here all the way to actually the first hymn ever sang by the Israelites, the first song recorded in the Bible right here from uh, Exodus chapter 15. The Lord will reign forever and ever. But the interesting thing about the Lord reigning forever and ever is that this song is repeated. There's the sense in which we mentioned that it gets into the Hebrew culture. It's perhaps a familiar song to them. But think about Revelation chapter 15. The context of Revelation chapter 15 is that there's an enemy, the false prophet and the, the beast, and they're defeated. And those that are with them, and that would be you and I, but also Israel. Now we're grafted into Israel. All of them are delivered. And look at what happens in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2. And I saw what happened to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses. Now, it's interesting. A delivered people standing by the sea on the beach and they're singing the song of Moses. They're singing Exodus chapter 15. And you and I will be in this group of people. The singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. The difference here between the Song of Moses and Revelation chapter 15, is that in the Song of Moses, it's one nation. Israel has been delivered. And the other nation that's not an Israelite nation is destroyed. But here in Revelation chapter 15, all the nations are coming together and they're worshiping God as, as one. You know, the French have a phrase, and maybe you've heard it before, used it, called a coup de grace. Have you ever heard that, that phrase? Uh, the word coup means to strike, de is of, of course, and gra is grace. And so it literally means, coup de gras means a strike of grace. So perhaps it originally meant a, um, a last blow that someone take in battle that we would say put them out of their misery, a, a merciful killing where they were suffering and that last blow was taken to put them out of their ministry, misery. It's come to mean something for us different though. It's come to mean probably the last bad thing that happens to someone before they're finally killed or taken out or their business fails or their ventures are taken out. Uh, something that coup de grace is that last final blow that causes something to fail. So you're reading Exodus and you're thinking, man, when Pharaoh saw these first signs that Moses gave him, you know, the snake that came from the staff and the water that's turned to blood. He should have seen, my word, if God can do this, he can do anything to me, I'm going to stop. But he doesn't. So plague number one happens and plague number two and three and four and all the way to plague number nine. Any one of those, any thinking person could think, my word, God could totally take me out. Any one of these could be a coup de grace. Maybe I should stop, but he doesn't. And then the Passover happens. The, the unthinkable where the firstborn is taken. And we would think this, this is the coup de grace. This is the last thing that's going to take him out. But it wasn't even that. The final coup de grace for the Egyptians was them being taken out through the Red Sea when all their chariots and that army was totally destroyed and wiped out. And while that was the final last straw, the coup de grace, if you will, for the Egyptians, it, it wasn't the final part of the story. Because after all, God's presence is going to reside among his people in a tabernacle. God's presence is going to reside among them on a temple. And the final thing God wants to do with them in the Old Testament is be a people among them. But that wasn't the coup de grace. That was the final thing of scripture. Finally, Jesus Christ would come and he would give his life as a sacrifice for us, God's Passover lamb. He would raise again to finally drive a death nail into the heart of the enemy to secure our salvation forever. But that wasn't it. The coup de grace of all of this leading from 
saw reading for Exodus chapter 15 forward is that what we see in Revelation chapter 15 is that all nations are coming. This is the coup de grace. This is the final end when you and I as believers are drafted into Israel as a nation and we all stand on the beach and sing of God's deliverance. And it's only then finally that God's deliverance makes sense. And then it's finally salvation through the water. You and I will stand there with a song of deliverance coursing through our veins with the great adrenaline of deliverance and we'll sing of God's great salvation. John MacArthur writes in his book, The Love of God, that he had a moment alone one time with Bill Gaither, the famous, famous hymn writer and songwriter, and singer. And he asked him this question. He said, Bill Gaither, what in your opinion is the greatest song ever written? And he, without hesitation, said it was Frederick Lehman's song, The Love of God, specifically the third verse of this. You may know it, but listen to this. This is the third verse of Frederick Lehman's O Love of God. Could we with ink the oceans fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God would drain the oceans dry? Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. It's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely incredible song. Oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take allusions to old songs and we'll update them and we're about to sing one right now. And so normally we end this time of prayer, but instead of going to God in prayer, we're gonna praise God. This will be a song of worship. If this is unfamiliar to you, the words will be on the screen. We're gonna sing a song, worthy, worthy. But this song begins with an allusion to Lehman's words from hundreds of years ago, from the song, The Love of God. Listen to how this song, Worthy, Worthy, begins. No pen or quill, no scribe in perfect skill. With flawless words could capture all you are. No lofty thought, no scholar of this world could grasp such an inch of such infinity. Though we cannot comprehend such a mystery, just a glimpse of you revealed is compelling us to sing. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy is your name. Now let's worship him. 